Buenos dias, mis amigos. All right, today I'm gonna criticize this video here by Old School Bible. And uh, just for the record, I'm sub subscribed to him. I like the guy, but he's wrong on whatever it is that he's trying to teach. Okay, um, you can watch the video for yourself. It's from today, this morning, I think, or yesterday, whatever. Doesn't matter. Um, he's <laughs> he's trying to teach dispensationalism, and uh, let me first of all let him speak for himself. Okay. Now here's what I I and I I don't know. Why they would want to do this? I, 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 the devil gets into it. It's the only reason I, I can, I can uh, uh, fathom of it. But you know, why someone would not want to see that and make up something else? And that's where you get these people talking about they were saved the same in the Old Testament, and they are as they're saved today. It's always been by grace. It's always been through faith. And it, here we're looking back at the cross. And back there in the Old Testament, they were looking forward to the cross. Everybody's always saved by grace through faith in Jesus. No. <clears throat> All right, so unbelievable. It's, it's incredible to me that you that a person would teach something that they have no idea what they're teaching. And if you watch this video for yourself, you'll see that this dummy never explains how people got saved before God was manifest in the flesh, before Jesus came in the flesh, before he walked on the earth, okay? The claim that he wants to make is that, well, it wasn't revealed until Jesus came. It wasn't revealed until Paul showed us the mystery that's that would be fine by itself the problem is when you say it's not always been by faith or by grace through faith okay it's always been by grace all right it's always been about faith always since the very beginning it's always been about faith and um, so let's uh, before we really dive into it let's listen to another clip real short here here is this is the new updated version amen so that when, once you do that, and you rightly divide, and you distinguish exactly who is being spoken to, when, under what circumstances, then every single piece of the puzzle falls perfectly in place. All confusion... Yeah, There's something I just now noticed. Watch this. ...being spoken to, when, under what circumstances... That, that little smile looks familiar to me. Uh, I, I want to give a thought, but I'm going to let that go. Then every single piece of the puzzle falls perfectly in place. All confusion goes away. All apparent contradictions go away. Everything falls right into the dispensation in which God gave it. And you have rightly divided the word of truth. I'm not going to go any longer because right. you know. Uh, so I, <laughs> that little smile threw me off. What was he talking about? Well, that's right, because it was two different dispensations. He was back here dealing with some other people with another set of rules, and over here is this is the new updated version. Amen. So that when, once you do that, and you rightly divide, and you distinguish exactly who is being spoken to. When, under what circumstances, then every single piece of the puzzle. 
uh, he hadn't even died on the cross yet. He hadn't shed his blood to cover sin yet. They were kind of saved on credit, if you will. There it is. That's what I was looking for. Saved on, kind of saved on credit. Right? You heard that, right? Hadn't shed his blood to cover sin yet. They were kind of saved on credit, if you will. Saved on credit. Back there. But they hadn't received the money yet. See? But they hadn't received the money yet. Alright, so here's the issue. Uh, were they saved on credit? Well, alright, so compare that idea with right now that we're bought and paid for right now because of Jesus paid for our debt. And it hadn't been paid for yet. Okay. Now, understand this. That the death of Jesus pays for our debt. But that doesn't save you, me, anybody. Alright, so the fact that Jesus paid for our debt, that's great, but that's not going to save everybody. Alright. Alright, so... How do I say this? We're saved by grace. <laughs> That's so hard to understand, isn't it? Saved by grace through faith. Jesus laying down his life doesn't save everybody. It's only by grace and Jesus laying down his life paid our debt so that we are covered if we believe and we believe then we are promised that by the grace of God we shall be saved. And then, of course, once that faith comes, right, then we are no longer under the law, right, but it's by the grace of God that we're saved through faith. It's like... Ah, uh, you know, it seems to me to be very simple. All right. Very simple. Very simple. So, knowing that, then you ought to know that what we have now, the mystery of God, it's been revealed to us that it's always been saved by grace through faith. That's revealed. It, nothing's changed other than the work has been done for us. That, But it hasn't changed how a person is saved. The truth has been revealed, once hidden, but now revealed. There was not a different way for people 
to get saved. It's always been by the grace of God. Man has always had the opportunity to do it themselves and every single time they have failed. There's only one possible way for man to be saved and that's by the grace of God and so let's do something here learn what this means I will have mercy and not sacrifice ah oh. Ah, oh, 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 oh. there it is. Go ye and learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, to turn from unbelief to belief. Alright. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Alright. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice. Alright. Go ye and learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. So, this is Old Testament. This is New Testament. This has always been. It's always been this way. It's revealed here in the New Testament that it's always been by grace. You're teaching some sort of bizarre religion that is foreign to the Bible when you teach this idea that they were saved another way in the Old Testament. That's not that's not true. That's not that's not it's not logical. It's not supported by any scripture at all. And it does not follow simple logic. No, they were saved. What? Let's just use an example. Because he never says how they were saved in the Old Testament. So we have to, I have to assume and guess what he thinks or what he thought for how people were saved in the Old Testament so let's I'm just gonna guess I watched the whole 17 minutes and 25 seconds he never once said anything about how they were saved in the Old Testament and it, I'm telling you they are saved by grace through faith now so I'm guessing, well, they had to do the works to be saved. Well, that's never been the case. And man has always failed to live up to that standard. Always. From the very beginning. From the very beginning, man has failed. All right. That's why he's looking at you sideways. You don't know what the hell he's talking about. Alright. So. Let's just guess. He's, he's saying that you, they were saved by works. and what, Except none of them were good enough. To be saved by their own works. If they were. Then there was no need for Jesus. To lay down his life. All right, there's that. It, if 
Jesus didn't have to lay down his life, their works would have been good enough. Therefore, Jesus, I mean, come on, man. You're basically saying Jesus died in vain because they didn't need his death to be saved. They could save themselves by their good works. Okay? Now, just I'm just saying, I'm guessing that he's saying, because he never says how they were saved in the Old Testament. I'm just guessing. They were saved by their good works. Yet their good works were never good enough. <laughs> All right. Now, here's the thing I don't think that in these people have put any thought into. All right. So if they were saved by another way in the Old Testament, at what point in time did that change? All right, so there had, according to your teaching, there had to come a particular point, a moment in time. All right, well, you're no longer saved this way. Now you're saved that way. When did that moment in time come? I mean, because it had to have been like, okay, Three, two, one. Now that's over. And now there's a new way to be saved. Right? Is, I mean, <laughs> it's stupid. I know you guys don't like, some of you guys don't like the word stupid. But stupid is stupid. All right, and this idea that people were saved another way in the Old Testament suggests that they don't need Jesus and that Jesus didn't need to die on the cross because they had another way to be saved. And now the only way to get saved is by grace through faith? <laughs> it doesn't make sense, man. It doesn't make sense. I desired mercy and not sacrifice. All right. Now, let me read just, uh, I guess, uh, just a little bit here of uh, Ephesians 3. You have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, Lord. How that by revelation he, ha he made known unto me the mystery. The mystery. It was always there. It's just revealed. It's not changed. This, that's not what this is talking about. Will, we've changed how we're doing business now. No, no, no. It's just being revealed. That's how it's been, and now it is known. Whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed, not changed, revealed. Huge, huge difference. Now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ, in Christ by the gospel. Okay. Which I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. All right. <laughs> it's always been. It's always been by grace. 
nothing has changed. Nothing. You go back to Genesis 3. When the Lord said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. You know, it's revealed now what that means. Okay, it could have been figured out. It could have been figured out. Could have been. Knowing good and evil. Right back here. Because their eyes are open. They Because they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The knowledge. They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eh, right? So, I mean, that's pretty important to get those words right. It's not they ate from the tree of good and evil. It's they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? Now, because they did that, their eyes are open and they can see knowing good and evil. And because they did that, the Lord says to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Enmity between the serpent and the woman, and between the serpent's seed and her seed. It shall bruise the serpent's head and thou shalt the serpent shall bruise his heel are you following that I mean it's amazing Be this word here his heel very important very important and I will put enmity between thee and the woman between your seed and her seed it shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel his is not referring to the serpent his is referring to Christ God it's referring to God and his people which is us that are born of God so God is going to stomp his foot on the head of the serpent so hard it's gonna bruise his heel it's gonna bruise our heel because we are of the seed of God. We are of the seed of the woman. We are the seed of Abraham. We are the seed of Christ. We are one with God. And there's coming a time when we will be lifted up, separated out of this world into the air with the Lord and fire will come down from God out of heaven and devour and stomp his foot on the enemy the prophecy from Genesis to Revelation okay Let's go to Hebrews 11 and let's rightly divide the word of truth here, okay? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it, he being dead, yet speaks. All right, so you're familiar with that, right? When the blood of Abel, here, let's just do it this way, I guess. And Genesis 4 and he said what hast thou done the voice of thy brother's blood cries unto me from the ground and consider this all right so um, and Adam knew his wife how do we do this here can I do it this way Um, all right, so just so you understand, because <laughs> this is kind of important. So when their eyes were opened and God says to the woman um, that, um, uh, let's see, where's this at? Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. All right, so now we have a situation where, hey, you're going to start having children. And now in chapter 4, Adam knew his wife, and she conceived. And who did she bear? Cain. Okay. She bare Cain. And said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother, Abel. So here we have the first two children born of Adam and Eve. Okay. Oops. Where am I going here? And the one brother, Cain, murders the younger brother, Abel. Right? Okay. In his blood, Abel's blood, cries unto God from the ground. Hebrews 11. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaks. So, do not lose sight of what we're reading here. By faith. By faith. Not by works. Which he did do. But by faith. Okay. By faith. Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God by faith. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him by faith. Noah 
being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. It's always been about faith and it's always been by grace. It's always, we've always been at the mercy of God. He's the one that made everything. It's incredibly ignorant. Is that fair to say? Incredibly ignorant, naive, to suggest somebody can be saved without the grace and mercy of our God. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous to suggest that somebody does not need the grace and mercy of our Lord to save us. And now it's revealed in the New Testament, it should be obvious because this mystery has been revealed, made known very plainly for us. It's been made very plainly known for us that we are saved by grace through faith. It's always been that way. Now, there is coming a judgment of God. That's important. It's important to know that. It's important to teach that. That this world is coming to an end. And just as important as all that is what are we putting our hope into what are we putting our faith into are we putting our faith into a bonus thousand years no that's stupid I, I look it's the popular teaching today hey we're gonna get a bonus thousand years of filthy dirty sex that's what is the popular teaching today and it's unbelievable nobody wants to hear the truth anymore it seems to me that people's ears are dull of hearing they just want to hear oh a thousand years A bonus thousand years or we're gonna be having sex and having children and and just more sex I mean really it's not that the main thing I mean isn't that why I mean if you're being honest aren't you teaching hey there's a thousand year period coming after Jesus returns the reason why you want to have faith in that is because you want to have sex for a thousand years you don't even want to talk about what happens after the thousand years as we see with Robert Breaker you'll see that on his board all he has is the end of the world this um, you know um, judgment seat of Christ where you're going to be rewarded for what, how many times you've walked an old lady across the street or whatever. And then a thousand year period. And that's, that's what he's putting his hope into. And then a question I would have is, is a person saved if they believe that? Well, because it's it just foreign. 
what if you put your faith in this idea that you're going to have your own planet and you're going to have 72 virgins all to yourself or maybe a million virgins why not and you just have sex with everybody and everything is that is that true faith are you saved if you believe that what what if you believe you're gonna turn into Superman you're gonna be transformed into a Superman with the cape is that is that the same I, I don't think it is that's why I think this is so important because what are we putting our faith into and I'm telling you I'm putting my faith into eternal life where there is no sin only perfection only equality oneness with God where all things are given to us and available for us and we are 100 percent free and no man rules over me neither do I rule over another man for all eternity uh, yeah, it just I, I don't I think people's visions are way off way off and that's why I'm here to shine a light on what it is that you believe do you believe in this idea of dominance for all eternity over another that's not everlasting life that's not eternal life at all at all All right. So, of course, in Revelation 21, we read about a new heavens and a new earth. And in this new heavens and a new earth, the tabernacle of God is with men. And there is no more tears, no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, neither shall there be any more pain. And of course, I mean, we get example after example, really, of what it's going to be like in the life to come hereafter. None of which is in regards to sex there's not sex for all eternity when this world passes away the lust also passes away we read in Genesis 3 how when the serpent deceived Eve and they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that the Lord sp spoke to the serpent and said I will put an enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his seed because this had, had been done because the serpent beguiled or deceived Eve now God has done this he has done this to the serpent and then he has done this to the woman and he has done this to the man to the woman childbearing and the desire to be with the husband and to Adam um, he's made to um, work the ground with his hands And this is 
this stuff here is because of Adam and Eve eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now once it, the end of the world comes, they will not be marrying and given in marriage. So there will not be um, bringing forth children and no longer will the ground be cursed for his sake and there's no more sorrow no more sorrow therefore in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life that's coming to an end okay so in in the life to come hereafter all this of the world is going away all the lust and all the evil is going to be done away with right so there is no more sex after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven because we read in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21 when Jesus is asked what is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world and of the end of the world and the world passes away it's the same thing so when the end of the world comes it's when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and we are lifted up in the air it's the same thing that we just read in Genesis 3 verse 15 right let's go there real fast because right? I <laughs> I think people forget oh yeah verse 15 thou shalt bruise his heel that can only mean one thing that's the end of the world that's the end of the world when the serpent is destroyed along with all evil evil is destroyed forever at the end of the world when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven he's gonna stomp his foot that's the same thing as us being up in the air with the Lord in one with the Lord when we are transformed into our glorified bodies when we are changed from corruptible into incorruptible from mortal into immortality this is when we are up in the air and we with God stomp our foot on the head of the serpent destroying all evil forever all right this is prophesied from Genesis all the way through Revelation that at the end of the world there's a great separation okay and then of course Jesus he he gives us many parables of the same thing it's unbelievable it's incredible it's fascinating as well he gives a parable of the wheat and the tares it's the same thing the wheat are gathered up into the air right into the Lord's barn if you will all right in the harvest that's the harvest that happens at the end of the world it's all the same thing man it's being told to us over and over in the same same way all right same same thing same thing over and over and over again it's pretty amazing now there's one thing I wanted to touch on all right was that in Hebrews 11 I can't remember now cannot remember uh, it was wasn't it I apologize for that right there let's see let's see where I can't remember where I'm at now okay so let's so we read all this here being that it's by faith 
by faith, by faith, right, through faith, 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 and now they desire a better country, that is, and heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. That country, that city, same thing. That's up in the air. That's up in the air, okay? That's when we are up in the air with the Lord, okay? Just like what we read in Genesis 3, so just like what we read in Revelation 20. Just like what we read everywhere else in the Bible. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. Where's that beloved city? And just like what we read about in, um, oops, in John 15, if I'm remembering correctly. Is it 14 or 15? Oh no, I'm wrong again. Oh boy, oh boy. Let's go to John 14. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Same thing over and over and over from Genesis to Revelation. Over and over and over again. Consistent all throughout. Okay? We go to Hebrew, or uh, Galatians, excuse me. Galatians 4, verse 26. Jerusalem, which is above, is free which is the mother of us all. So it's consistent all throughout the Bible that our country, our city, is above. It's, it's where we put our hope into. It's what we put our faith into. We are strangers right now. We are strangers in a strange land. And it's very strange. I mean, it's getting stranger by the day. Alright, and now consider this. Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. And if the Son shall make you free, Then ye shall be free indeed. Alright, so when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and we are transformed into our glorified bodies, we will be completely free. Completely free. Alright, with no limitations. No limitations. Therefore, man will not have rule over you. He will not have support, superiority over you. He will not have power over you. He will not have authority over you. Therefore, how many times you walk an old lady across the street, that that's not going to give you authority, power, prestige over me for all eternity. You should be humble enough to accept the gift of eternal life. That should be enough. I mean, you couldn't ask for anything more. If you're wanting more, in other words, you're wanting to have authority and power or rule over somebody else. You're on the wrong side of the fence. You're headed in the wrong direction. All 
All right, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, being born of the Spirit of God, then eternal life should be enough and being equal with others, equal with God, should be enough. Should be enough. So, if it's enough, then you ought not be teaching this idea that, well, if you're doing great service, you're going to get extra rewards over some dumbo like me who, what am I doing? I'm sitting here doing a YouTube video. Meanwhile, these other guys, they're going out there and they're feeding hungry children and giving them clothes. Now, their service is ten times greater than what I could do. It's ten times greater in one day than what I could do for my entire life. Their service far exceeds my lifetime of service. Their service of one day far exceeds my service in my entire life. So I'm cursed for all eternity because I don't have the money, the power, the means to do the good services that they do. Is that right? Is that what you believe? I don't think people are looking at it that way. I think they're looking at it, well, I'm, yeah, I do. I'm a wonderful person, and I'm doing great, terrific, and wonderful things, and I'm lording over other people right now, and therefore, for all eternity, I'm going to lord over you. That's what they're thinking. They're not thinking about the other side. And I'm looking at it from the other side. I'm looking at it as, okay, you are claiming that you have great service, therefore you're going to have great rewards and power and authority over me, who has nothing. I'm nothing. I'm, I have nothing. I was born poor, I'll die poor, and that's it. I, I, don't, I got nothing that I can give to God and say, hey, look, God, I'm 100% at the mercy of God. 100%. What can I claim to God that I'm worthy? Save me, Lord. I'm worthy. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. But yet you want to claim your service, your rewards are going to be greater than mine. Well, buddy, I tell you the truth. There may be no reward for you at all. 